Obviously, you've had them before last semester. Things of that kind of flow, similar to what you expect in 2002. One exception uh, is quizzes. So uh, we are going to forego any class quiz quizzes this semester and try something a little bit different. And we're going to have uh, Canvas quizzes once a week. All right, those quizzes are live now. By the way, so if you look, the first quiz is up. It'll be live between generally Mar uh, Monday through Friday of every week, and it'll close down at, at midnight on Friday. It's a one-shot quiz, though. All right, so be, don't don't just open it up and kind of see what this quiz is all about. You get one attempt at it. You generally get about a minute per question. Right, individual work. You can use open book, whatever you want. Just do it individually. But don't take it until you feel you're ready. So you've looked at the concepts for the week and you understand, because it's gonna cover the material for the week, general lectures and readings, uh, and it's gonna be guided by some general takeaways, and I'll show you that when we go into the first lecture of the day. So, you take it anytime you want on Canvas, just has to be turned in by midnight on Friday after that first quiz. Uh, homework's gonna work exactly like 2002. Basically, you'll have a set every week that covers the lecture material for that week. You'll, you'll have infinite opportunities to answer most of the questions via Canvas quiz. They give you that feedback whether you're right or wrong. They'll take your highest score out of those. And then there'll be one question, the one that's underlined and bolded in the schedule, that you will require an upload of your full work. Because generally those are the more involved questions anyway that require a little bit more nuance in terms of the grade uh, aspects of it. But that roughly equates to what you guys did in 2000. All right, in terms of that. Yeah? So the quiz is all concepts. So kind of the same breakout. Use a quiz to reinforce concepts, use the homework to reinforce some of the work right, So no, you don't have to do the homework first um, before you get into the quiz. Good question. Any other questions on just kind of the structure of the course and how we're going to run? Okay, I can't emphasize enough, and I'll emphasize this again on Wednesday when we start talking specifics about the lab. Attendance in the lab is going to be really important. All right, you guys will be working on teams to design an air vehicle, a singular air vehicle. All hands on deck are needed for that in terms of going forward. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the structure of the lab on Wednesday, though, so I won't get into depth, in depth on that. Um, you'll have a variety of, of assistants doing this course that are, are really intimately familiar with this course. This is somewhat new. The course isn't new, obviously. Content isn't new. But the lab integration with this course is new as of last semester, so we have a lot of TFs. Uh, Lindsay's our, our, our lead TAs, Ian, one of our TAs. We'll all introduce those guys again when we get to the actual lab portion. They'll be helping a great deal on this lab. They've got experience uh, specific to the way we've been doing things. We're changing some things up a little bit uh, this year, but in general, um, they know what's going on when it comes to that. And hopefully, we'll get one of you guys a successful flight uh, by the end of this. So, the key when you look at the kind of schedule, obviously, you know where the exams are. But the other key is as you start looking forward to kind of making a schedule for your semester and thinking things through, that last week in February, the last two weeks are really important. So that first, uh, February 24th and 28th, you'll have two days where it's purely flying. All right, so for the entire lab sections from 8.30 in the morning to pretty much the end of the day, we're going to be outside flying your guys' designs uh, based on the schedule that, that's being put in now. In the middle of that, sandwich in between that fly week is your last exam. And the reason why we're having that last exam a little bit early, as opposed to the last week of my portion of the course, is that that last week you're focused on doing your final presentations of your design, based upon your flights and everything else that went on, doing some data compiling, and so there's just a focus on presentations that last week. So those two weeks, the last week of February, first week in March, are kind of some, uh, two big weeks when it comes to uh, kind of great events for this course. All right, any other questions on the admin side? Again, we'll go over some of the course policies and some of the stuff tomorrow with uh, Professor Clark and Professor Nelson. All right. So let's let's talk about today's lesson. All right, anyone know what that airplane is? Or is it an airplane? That's the other question. It may not be the same question. Okay, round effect Russian plane, what do you got? What is that again? A cranial plane, yeah, it's a kind of a weird name. The cranial plane, so this, this is a satellite image that showed up in the 1960s that the U.S. saw at a, at a former Soviet, or a Soviet anyway, I think it wasn't former at the time, and they were a little bit puzzled about what it is, so just a real quick background video just to kind of give you some thought on that. In 1967, whilst the U.S.'s first spy satellite drone was busy photographing the Soviet Union, something unusual was spotted. 
It looked like a massive plane, but its wings were too short. It also sported the Soviet Navy flag, its fuselage. So what was it? Maybe an unidentified aircraft? Or some new design of amphibious living? This Leviathan was in fact the crown plane. A new class of what is now known as a ground effect vehicle. And that this is a phenomenon that occurs when a wing is traveling. The Akrana plan was the great child of Wattislav Alexiev, a Russian designer who began his career working on high speed hydrophiles. Throughout the 1950s, he developed a number of successful ships, rising to lead the central hydrophile design bureau in the city of Gorky and the River Volga. But still, his first speed added to his most famous idea to lift the hydrophiles famous account of the world at the time. Alexia's innovation was to use this ground effect phenomenon and he envisioned a huge vehicle with the capacity of a ship and speed. Alright, so, ground effect. Any pilots in the audience? <laughs> what is ground effect? Alright, so if you say today, what is it? It's a ground effect they're playing. What does that mean? What is ground effect? No, but that actually, so that's the, the pretty standard definition, and you hear it a lot when you're in the age of pilot training or whatever it is. It's the cushion of air that basically supports your airplane, kind of gives you a nice little lift as you get close to the ground, right? right? That's typically what people think about with ground effect. We're going to dig into that a little bit more, right? Because, well, that's a generic definition that I guess if you, if you think about the physical mechanism, it makes sense. It's not the specific definition and the, and the description of the phenomenon that I want you guys to have going forward. So today we're going to talk about finite wings, or three-dimensional wings, and leave behind the world of, of theoretical unicorns, dragons, and two-dimensional wings. Um, but we're still going to use that information. But obviously, this is going to be an important aspect of doing aircraft design, right? How they design your wing is predominantly kind of the gist of, of, of most aircraft designs to start with. And when we talk about ground effect, ground effect is directly tied to the phenomena that occur when you, when you make a finite wing versus you have a theoretical infinite wing in the original version. So let's talk about kind of what those effects are in terms of choice. So the takeaways, and this is kind of the takeaway side that I was going to talk, I was talking about before. So this is kind of your guided reading questions that we had last year, but now putting them up front in, in, the, in the lecture because we have kind of at your leisure time to do the quiz whenever you want. As last year, we've kind of taken the training wheels off. These aren't the actual questions you will see. They're just broadly speaking the topics that I will be asking you questions on. I uh, kind of have a guide on where your focus is. The readings for today span a lot more than this, by the way. And they're good, but we've talked about a lot of them already. One section is on swept wings, the other section is on flaps. A little bit more detail there. We by all means read those, but the focus is this because this is kind of the area we're focusing on in terms of our vehicle design. It's on finite wings and what they're like. Okay. When we start, though, in terms of that means the concepts, just like we did last year, we got to make sure we're all on the same page when we talk about number equation, right? How do we speak in the different terms that we're going to use in this course, right? Because words matter, specific words matter, and, and understanding what they mean is important. So we've used some of these already. So what is S for us, Marianne? What is S? S. More specific than wing area. Planform area. Okay. So what's the difference between like planform area and just saying area? There you go. So the, the term you kind of would think of the big wing would have in your head is the planform area is the shadow of the wing. It's not the wing area. It's what we call the area which we call all the surface area of the wing to do all the curvatures and everything else. Like if you were actually going to put a skin on the wing, that's your wet area. Planform area is just that surface area. You notice that it, it covers the entire span of the wing, from wingtip to wingtip, that's called your wingspan, that's the B variable for our nomenclature. And it also includes the portion of the wing that is hidden by the fuselage, right? So it goes all the way to the center line of the, of the aircraft. So you'll notice, like, so last year when we were looking at airfoils and just saying, okay, we're going to use this airfoil data and we'll treat it like a wing, even though we know it's 2D. We mainly dealt with rectangular wings, or what we call Hershey bar wings, right? It's perfectly rectangle, so the span times the cord was your platform area. Right, today we're going to go a little bit beyond that and start a new design, because I don't expect that all your designs will 
purely the rectangular wings. And we're going to be tracking the little wings. So with that, I'll see the equations and the calculations of that change, and only slightly based upon that into a trapezoidal area. But in terms of, of, of uh, aircraft nomenclature now, we're talking in terms of root chord and tip chord. That's the C sub R, which is your root chord. That's the chord length of your wing at the center line, and your tip chord, which is that of a wing tip. So now you have that in there, you'll notice your, your chord variable now has a bar over it because it's your mean aerodynamic chord. It's no longer just a singular value because it can vary throughout the span of your wing. Okay, so S changes accordingly to C. So just make sure you're not following the track, just assuming that S is always a rectangular area in this case we're using that. What's AR? Aspect ratio. What is aspect ratio? Do you know what it is? What does it tell you, generally speaking, about the airplane? Okay, it said chord to span ratio. True for a rectangular wing, right? It's B over C. If you look at the equation there, it's B squared over S, S being your area. So you can think of that. But what is, so physically, what would that mean then? If I have a high aspect ratio, what kind of wing do I have? High aspect ratio wing. Big, small, stubby. What's that? Small wing? Think about what high means. So a large number of aspect ratio. So what's B? It is your waistband. So if that's the numerator and you have a high aspect ratio, your span to area is big. So high aspect ratio means I have a long, generally speaking, skinny wing. Right? Think of the wider wing. Is a high aspect ratio wing. Low aspect ratio, short and stubby wing, right? kind of like a fighter wing, if you want to think about it that way. Small or sort of bumblebee's wing, that's a low aspect ratio wing. Right? Aspect ratio is going to be a key parameter for you. It's one of the main parameters that you'll actually design for. It's not the only thing and everything, but you'll find that it pops up as being a major contributor to some of the performance metrics that you guys will be looking at when you design your flight. It's not the only thing you can change, like we talked about, but it is going to be one of the major things. So aspect ratio is going to be important to get comfortable with and understanding. All right. The last one we haven't talked about yet in this course, that lambda is taper ratio. And it's just purely how tapered your wing is. So it's your, your tip cord divided by your root cord. Now there's some confusing terminology around this because a lot of people say I have a highly tapered wing, but a highly tapered wing means I have actually a low taper ratio because it's tip over cord. Right? So a little bit weird in terms of that. Just be very clear when you say high taper, low taper. If you're talking about the ratio, or you're just talking in you know, generality, physical description, whether something is tapered or not, um, that's going to make a difference. All right. So that's just general terminology. Note I've also highlighted the horizontal stabilizer in this picture. All these same metrics or parameters apply to that as well because it's just another wing. All right. Now normally, to differentiate between the main wing of an aircraft, we would use subscripts of H or T to denote tail or horizontal, right? For the most part, when we do our analysis, it's all reference relative to the wing, because the wing is the dominant lifting surface of your aircraft. But when you analyze the lifting surface of your tail, as you will when you get to looking at longitudinal stability for your tail, or for your airplane, uh, you're going to use some of these same parameters, but you want to be very clear not to mix up, am I talking about a tail, or a wing time period, for example. Okay, but we'll get to that towards the end of the course. I'm not that big. All right. So, having gone through that nomenclature, let's talk a little bit more about flight line wings versus 2D wings. So, what do you guys think? Just intuitively, just think about kind of what wings are doing, right? One of your last questions in 2002 in the final was, how does a wing create and lift? Why would it matter? If I take a 2D airfoil section out of the wind tunnel and just put it out there in the free air to fly, and now that there are wind tips, why do wind tips matter? What do you think physically happens from a phenomenal wise with the flow when I suddenly put wing tips on something? What do you think happens? Yeah? It's not going to be a smooth flow over top of the wind, but over top of the wind itself. Okay. It's going to get closer to the wing tip. How so? That is exactly right. How so? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so 
think again about what are, what is the two sources of forces, aerodynamic forces, that we talked about in 2000? Two sources. Shear stress and pressure distance, right? In terms of those two things. So when we look at a wing and we suddenly give it wing tips, instead of just assume it's infinite, so here's my wing, all right? I have what kind of pressure on the bottom of the wing if I'm creating lift? High and low on top, hopefully, right? If I'm, if I'm climbing or if I'm staying airborne supporting my weight, right? If suddenly there's not a wall between those two, I now have a pathway, especially out here on the wingtips, where I can have airflow that circulates over the top of that portion, right? Air is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure, that makes sense, right? And it's going to go there the easiest way possible. The flow that's near that wingtip, that easiest way possible sometimes, is around that outer edge, right? So it changes your flow fuel around that wing. It's no longer this nice, straight, you know, steady flow that, that has no component in any other direction than the direction you're moving in, right? It creates a change in that pressure distribution that really has a dramatic impact on your lift and your drag, right? So it's that pressure spillage that's coming across those wingtips that's having that, that factor. So if you look at this specifically, though, that pressure spillage across the wingtip results in wingtip vortices, right? And those vortices changing that flow field really affect how much lift and drag you have. And there's two physical ways you can think of it. One was the way that was described over here. Right? If I have a component of air that's circulating around the tip, I've changed the flow field. And what happens is, is that my resultant force from that pressure distribution basically camps more backwards. And we'll talk about that in the picture there. The other way you can think of it is, is a canting of the lift factor. All right? So what do I mean by that? How was lift and drag defined in 2001? What was lift and drag defined? They're just labels, remember, but they're labels of what? There you go. So lift and drag reduced the components of your normal axial forces, right? But it wasn't relative to the core. Lift and drag is relative to what vector? Relative wind, right? The velocity vector. Right? So in this case, in this picture, velocity vector coming into that wind. Normally, I draw my lift perpendicular there and my drag parallel to that velocity vector. Right? But once I get this component of airflow that is coming over this wingtip, what I end up with is this downward component of velocity as that relative wind gets close to my wing. And that downward component pushes down my relative wing in, in the presence of, of that wingtip. And the result is my lift actually camps backwards slightly because it's still, by definition, perpendicular. What I'm basically describing is a change in pressure drag, right? I have a component of pressure distribution that is more prevalent opposite of the direction of my travel as a result of this downward component of velocity to the flow. Physically, you can interpret that as canting of the lift vector. So now that I have a component of lift in, in the direction of drag, and as you can imagine, that's going to increase our drag, but it also decreases our lift. So the two main impacts of having wingtips is a reduction in lift and an increase in drag. Both bad things, right, in general when it comes to wings. Right? That reduction in lift we'll talk about a little bit in a little bit, but you can tell that all two wings are pressure distribution. If the component that is in the direction of travel or opposite of the direction of travel is, is larger, that obviously is the reduce all the component that is supporting your weight or keeping you airborne, so he reduces that lift. It's a function of span line distribution, which we'll talk about later, but we'll get to that go forward. But the point I'm going to focus on now is that increase in drag, right? That increase in drag is called our reduced drag. Right? And it is a, just another form of pressure drag, because your pressure distribution is changing over the top due to this downwash. Don't worry about the approximation. We're going to calculate this more directly later. I'm using some, some formulas from finite weight theory, but that is generally the phenomenon. So any questions on kind of the phenomenon that occurs with finite wings. Reduction in lift, increase in drag. Yeah? Is that a question or just a stretch? Okay, cool. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like out in the world, out in the wild. Normally, you don't fly through two billowing clouds of smoke, but this is what it looks like.
pretty cool little swirls. So just one side. I don't have many flying stories, but this is one flying story I remember because I almost died. Right? So when you learn to fly, you learn about these trailing vortices a lot. Uh, I was learning to fly in Boise. They have two parallel runways. And uh, I was in the pattern with, with uh, Southwest Airlines plane. I'm not sure what. He was landing before me. He had landed well ahead of me, and I came in. And they always tell you, be careful with your spacing on landing because these vortices are very persistent. And they're extremely strong. Uh, I ran over game at touch and go, so I was doing touch and go landings. And as soon as I hit the runway, I basically almost flipped onto my nose. And I turned about 90 degrees to the runway. It just rotated me uh, completely sideways. Uh, I immediately did a full stop and got off the runway because <laughs> I was scared. And I needed to go to the bathroom at that point after I uh, almost flipped my airplane. But these things are strong, is really what I want to get at. And they're really strong the greater the lift you have, right? If you're generating a lot of lift, you have a big differential between the top and bottom surfaces of the airplane. So on landing and takeoff, where you have a lot of lift because you're going slow, right? Your CLs are, are really high because you have a little velocity, you get a very strong vortice that develops, right? And you can see how it could affect the flow pattern around your, your wing. A little bit more uh, scientific look at the, the wing vortices in terms of visualization. Let's take a look at what it looks like in a smoke tunnel. I apologize, the screens are a lot smaller than, than Arrow 120, so it doesn't come across. But you can already see, and it doesn't just happen trailing the wing, you can see over the actual length of the cord itself, you start seeing that downwash. And you see as you increase the angle of attack and increase that lift potential, you can see that flow really developing circular flow and down, downward flow much a lot of the cord length of that, of that wing. So just because they're trailing in vortices, it affects the flow field. Uh, over the top of it just as much as trailing. Okay. So hopefully that gave you that good visual. So that, what does that mean in terms of quantifying our lift when you catch on lift? So lift curve slope, you guys should be familiar with this from 2002, right? Going back and looking at CL versus alpha. So as I change my angle of attack, how does my coefficient of lift change? Remember the nomenclature standard aerodynamics. If I have a lowercase L or lowercase P, I'm talking two-dimensional. If I have uppercase, I'm either talking three-dimensional lane or whole aircraft. All right, so lowercase CL versus alpha, I have that nice lift curve slope. Look what happens when I add a wing. We'll worry about the equations later. Let's just talk conceptually what's going on. So the first thing you notice is what changes? What changes it. Decreased lift, but in what specific variable are we looking at there? There you go, lift versus angle of attack. So remember your CL alpha, or your change in CL, or over your change in alpha, which we shorten up as just a lowercase a. That is your lift curve slope, the amount of CL you get per change in angle of attack. Now remember in 2002, we said that this, this value is gener generally speaking, when you're just doing first order uh, conceptual work, about 0.1 per degree for most airforce. All right, that's how your lift changes per angle of attack. You can see that slope has decreased dramatically. But it wasn't just a shifting of the line directly downward. Why didn't the whole curve just drop downward? And I didn't change the lift for all angle attacks versus this gradual change. Why didn't it just drop out completely? Think about the phenomenon that's resulting in this, right? The downwash. What has to exist in order for a downwash to occur? You have to have a difference in pressure, right? Just because you have a wingtip, but if you have no pressure difference top and bottom, you're not going to get that flow that comes over the wingtip. So you'll notice when my angle of attack goes to zero, and in this case, it's a symmetric airflow, not always zero, but when my coefficient of lift goes to zero, I should say, I have no difference between the two lines. They intersect the zero lift point at the same part. Because there's no lift generation, I have no downwash, I have no impact. But as that lift slowly changes, as I increase my angle of attack and I increase my lift, that downwash becomes more prevalent. And it becomes more prevalent at higher angles of attack. So you get this overall rotation of the, code, of the lift curve slope. And we can characterize that change using, and this is outside the, this, this course, I think, I think you covered the 3111. Did you guys go through that? Yeah. In uh, finite wing theory, I think if you print a lifting line, you'll model these vortices across a span. And you'll be able to see where we get this, but we're not worrying about that right now. You're just trying to learn the concept, right, of what happens. We can characterize that change in lift curve slope with the two equations that I have boxed there, right? So A is your lift curve slope. 
A0 is your lift earth move for your 2D infinite wing example, or ideal situation. And then A is the uh, conversion of that based upon having a finite wing, right, as it changes as going forward. The other kind of odd thing is you do this, you'll notice that it's kind of not as good as one of my little cartoon flying. You actually stall at a much higher angle of attack with a wing than you would a 2D wing, right? Because it kind of effectively reduces the amount of coefficient lift you get for angle of attack. You can actually increase your angle of attack much higher than you would for a 2D wing. Small marginal benefit, I guess, for having a 3D wing over a, the two-dimensional ideal wing, right? But the thing I want you to focus in on now, as we start talking, remember this course is about vehicle design, and you're always going to be looking at what variables can I impact with my design? All right, what variables can I change up? And you've got two main ones here. Aspect ratio, which you guys are familiar with, and E, which you guys are not. E is what we call span efficiency ratio. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slide on how you impact that. But aspect ratio, let's talk about why aspect ratio matters. All right, so remember what aspect ratio was, right? Skinny and long or short and stubby wings. What kind of wing do you think has less impact for that? Downwash or induced drag has less impact on it. Long, skinny, or short stubby? Why? Kind of, but the wrong dimensional that I'm looking at there. So long, skinny wing, right? You have tip effects always, but really it's the span that helps you, right? If you have a long wing, how much downwash is affecting that middle portion of the wing? A lot less, right? Because you've got this big wing shielding it from that downwash as it goes out farther and farther. So really you see the in use drag effects only at the tips of the wing. Whereas if I had a short, stubby wing, the whole wing is impacted by downwash a lot more. So that kind of drives the point to why you see aspect ratio there in the denominator is that if you have a larger version of that, generally the impact to your lift curve slope is less okay, in terms of that value. E, we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about span uh, lift distributions as we go through. So keep that in the back of your mind. All right, and we talked about that in zero angle of attack, it's unchanged, or zero lift, it's unchanged on the original. So you've seen this graphic before, we used it in 2002, we talked about the drag for a whole aircraft, or a whole wing in this case. We've covered all those portions of 2002 minus the induced drag piece. And this is the piece we're covering today to kind of finish the picture on full drag for a wing. All right, so your profile drag is your viscous drag with your skin friction and the pressure drag that results. Induced drag, remember, it's just another form of pressure drag. Right, it really is just another form of pressure drag. But it's a pressure drag that's dependent upon your angle of attack and lift. And that's the difference between induced drag and just your normal profile drag, pressure drag component, right, in terms of, of those two pieces there. So if you remember back in 2002, what did the drag curve look like for an airfoil versus lift? So your CL versus CD curve. Do you remember what that looked like? Was it a straight line? One of these, yeah, it's a parabola, right? Like a bucket, right? So as you increase your coefficient of lift, your coefficient of drag increases as well because you are increasing basically the pressure drag component of your profile drag, right? right? So now that I've introduced another form of drag, induced drag, how do you think that changes that curve? How would that curve change? Shift it up. Remember what phenomena is giving you more of an induced drag. Do you have any induced drag when you have zero lift? No, because you have no pressure difference top and bottom of the airfoil. So no pressure difference, no vortices developing, no induced drag, right? So at zero lift, you shouldn't see much change at all. In fact, you shouldn't see no change, generally speaking. You'll see a marginal change to your overall drag. Where should you see the biggest impact of induced drag? Higher CLs, right? And that's exactly what you see. So this little cartoon of your of what we call the wing drag puller, you'll do this for a whole aircraft next lesson, but this is just for a wing, is composed of these two things. So you've already covered skin friction and pressure drag last semester. 
And now we're adding on that induced drag component. And it varies as you would expect because the phenomenon of downwash is a function of lift, an angle of attack. As your lift increases, that component of induced drag rises greater. So you get this tightening of the parabola. It's steeper up at the higher coefficients of lift. And now we have this breakout as you look at the chart. Is that first portion is due to your coefficient of drag, C little d, of your airfoil, two-dimensional. So that includes skin friction and profile drag of that airfoil, right, at zero lift, basically. And then you get your induced drag portion, which is adding on that portion of pressure drag due to the wing tip effects. This equation that characterizes CDI, which is your induced drag coefficient, this is what comes from that finite wing theory that you'll, you'll cover in 3111. Right? For now, we're just going to utilize that and understand the concepts of kind of what we into. Okay. Any questions on the general impact of wing tips or finite wings when it comes to lifts and drag? Pretty straightforward. Basically all bad for the most part, less lift, more drag. But what it consists of is, is important to know as well. Let's talk a little bit about that E factor, that span efficiency factor. All right? So if you were to take a wing and basically take cross sections of the wing at an equal distance and then plot the coefficient of lift or the lift at every section of that wing as you went outward from the center line to the roof, what you would end up with is what we call a span lift distribution. All right. And three typical kind of representative lift, uh, yeah, can talk. wings are shown up in the slide above and the different lift distributions both in terms of absolute lift and coefficient of lift are plotted uh, in the picture you see above. So let's talk a little bit about that E factor. Right? E factor obviously has a big impact on how much drag you have because you solved in the equation for the, the induced drag coefficient uh, alongside of the aspect ratio. But how and why is important. So let's look first at this wing here, which is just your, your basic run of the mill rectangular wing. All right? As you would expect, it's a rectangular wing. The cord lengths are, are the same across the entire span. It has a pretty consistent lift profile throughout that span, except when you get to the wingtips, and then it dies off dramatically. All right? The reason why you get that huge drop in lift right at the wingtips is because with this square wing, you have a really high pressure difference between the top and bottom of the airfoil right at the wingtip. Because right? you've got this really big wing that suddenly just disappears off a cliff. So that high pressure difference results into a really strong downwash right at the wingtips, which is this, this row here. That downwash, when it swirls over, right, reduces the effective angle of attack at the tips. It really kills your lift right at the tips. OK, not that big of a deal. It will generate a decent amount of lift of that entire wing. OK, I'm, I'm OK with that. So let's look at the opposite kind of wing. This is a, just a very opposite. You don't see wings like this out there for good reason. Just a, a diamond shape triangular wing, where now I've taken this wing tip to nothing at the tips. As you would expect, lift dies off naturally at the tips because I have basically no airfoil at the tip anymore. But you'll notice as I get closer to the tip, in this case, my CL goes to infinity. Why does my coefficient of lift at the wing tip here go to infinity, even though I'm getting basically no lift at the, at the tips? How do, I, how do I calculate coefficients of lift? It's lift divided by what? Length. Lift divided by two, two variables, right? One's your dynamic pressure, and then platform area. For a two-dimensional section, it's basically your chord, right? So it's C times one, if you want to consider a unit, unit span. So my chord went to near zero, it's going to, to a point. So when you divide by near zero, you're going to infinity, right? So basically, even though you're getting no lift at the tips, you've increased the coefficient of lift at that point on your wing as you approach the tip to really, really high values. And that's going to become important later. But, but when you look at the downwash, because I have very little lift out of the tips, I'm not creating much downwash because that pressure differential at the tip is pretty small, generally speaking, right? The other version is this elliptical wing that you see up here. Now, an elliptical wing gives you basically a consistent or uniform downwash across the entire wing. 
So it's shaped in a way that basically allows a, a nice, steady, constant downwash across your entire span. From theoretical calculations, it's been shown that an elliptical wing or elliptical disc region gives you the least amount of induced drag. And that E, that span efficiency factor, is equal to 1. So the least amount of drag you can get. So why don't we, have you guys seen any planes with elliptical wings? How's that? I heard it. What's that? If, if you're talking about that shape, these are front view cross section. So this is still an air point. Yeah. Top view. This is looking down top on the wing. Yeah. Top view. Sorry, I should have clarified that. Yes, top view. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of the most common you think about is the British Spitfire airplane having an elliptical wing. And the reason they designed it for that, because theoretically, again, it gives you the least amount of induced drag, which can be a huge advantage. But we don't see it often. Why don't we see it? But that, yeah, that's a good that's a good reason for it as well, right? You would think in the age of now, especially, that it'd be easy to manufacture a complex shape like that. But it is still hard. And a lot of it is, is fitting the structure necessary to the stand the loads and stuff when you take the wingtip down to that thin of a kind of a circular elliptical shape going forward. But there's another reason, and that's flight performance in terms of, and we talked about this is the typical range of the span efficiency. But stall performance. All right. So if I look at this rectangular wing here, right? Remember, my CLs are pretty constant across that whole wing for a rectangular wing. It dies off a little bit uh, on there in terms of the end. But because I have that constant cordon length, most of my CLs across the wing are pretty consistent across the board. And so when I stall, remember, I stall, I stall when I maximize my coefficient width of that wing. I take it a little bit farther, it no longer generates that lift. It's going to stall, generally speaking, across either the whole span or the back span of the wing and stall forward. Whereas if I look at this wing tip here, where it goes to a point, remember my CLs at the tip are extremely high. Right? My CLs are really high there. So the first thing that stalls on that wing is the wing tips. And then it goes inward from that point. What's the problem with your wing tip stall? First. There are control surfaces out there, right? That's where your ailerons are. You can generally you put your control surfaces out where you have a moment arm to actually roll the airplane and do whatever. So if the very first thing that stalls on your airplane is the thing that allows you to control it, it's a bad thing, right? So having that really sharp point out there is generally not a good idea. Now generally, we, we for a lot of general aviation planes, especially where you're trying to learn to fly, this is kind of the preferred way because even though you get a lot of, of lift loss because you're stalling at the root, which is where most of your lift is being generated. You know, if you're in the center of the airplane, you're stalling. It makes your nose fall rapidly, which tells you you stall, which can be a good thing if you're a student. But you maintain control so you can keep the wings level and you can control the plane to the stall and recover. Right? If I have a situation and if I'm training a plane and I stall on my tips first, if I get any sort of rolling motion, it's hard to recover from that. My, my control surfaces have that stall out, and now I either get into a spin or a stall spin, you know, goose going out in the ocean, spinning around in circles. Not a good thing, right, in terms of that. So flying characteristic-wise, you can have some trouble with some really sharp point finite wings. Usually we end up with something more like this, right? It's like slightly tapered wing, because what taper allows me to do is shape my lift distribution to where I'm close to my elliptical, but avoid some of the extreme issues of stalling at the wings. All right, so there's some shape, discussions there that, that allow you to do, um, depending upon the, the function of your airplane, what you want to do with it. All right. But typically speaking, these are the values you're going to see for E, and that's the reason why. Really, it comes to how close is that lift distribution to elliptical. If it's, if it's perfectly elliptical, you get E of 1. If it's less than, you get something slightly less than, than 1. And again, that's generally empirically determined. Right, you have to go and actually test given designs to determine what that E value is. So kind of going back to looking at design perspective, how we design a main plan for. Yeah. So like the airliners, the airliners are Yeah. Absolutely. And we'll talk about that actually in the next slide. The winglets that you see on airliners are precisely to look at this phenomenon and to, to impact some of these issues. So but let's talk about the ones we've talked about so far. So taper ratio. 
Taper ratio is the design feature of your wing that you can adjust to try to get that more elliptical lift distribution, right? To try to reduce some of that induced drag over, say, a perfectly just easy rectangular or wing that is out there. Now, you guys haven't done this yet, but you guys are going to build a wing. Building a wing is a lot harder than it sounds, and sometimes getting these nice tapers and, and these cheap geometries, they may seem simple, but they actually are hard. So you're going to see how or why a lot of manufacturers just default to rectangular wings because right, it's much, much easier than trying to make this taper. Uh, but that's generally why you see the tapers, trying to get that elliptical platform to reduce your reduce drag. The other way you can do it is via twist. So rather than changing the shape of your cord and, and changing that taper ratio, what you can do is just twist the wing tip to where it's at a lower angle of attack than the rest of your wing. Right? So as you increase your angle of attack, even if you're at 8 degrees angle of attack on your wing, maybe your wing tip is only at 4 degrees angle of attack. So you can shape that lift distribution just by simply changing what we call the incident at the wing tip. There are two types of twists, geometric and aerodynamic. Geometric is exactly the kind of sound. You just actually physically twist the wing. There's two versions, wash out, wash in. Wash out is you're reducing the incident, which is typically what you see. It's a lower incident at the wing, so they're drooped downwards, or the nose is drooped downwards on the wing tips. Or wash in, which is the, the actual tip are, are twisted upward. Right? But you don't see it often. The picture you see next to it with the SR-71 is a really kind of dramatic uh, demonstration of twist for a very thin wing. You can kind of see kind of that variation across. If you ever look at one at a museum somewhere, unfortunately they get the museum because they're not flying, but you can see, you can kind of see that far away picture kind of that drooping of the, of the wing tips uh, out there. All right. The other way you can twist is aerodynamic twist. And that's changing the airfoil profile as you go from the, the root of the wing to the tip of the wing. Right, so you can change the camber, or you can change the thickness to reduce the coefficient of lift outward of the wingtip without having to twist it physically. And sometimes that's easier to do from a manufacturing standpoint than actually twisting the whole wing at a given angle. The last thing on there I'm beginning to really talk about was sweep. So again, your reading covers some of the mock uh, issues when, when it comes to sweep and flaps. And we talked about that in 2002. I'm not focusing on it here because it's not going to, you're not going to be building a sweep sign library. Uh, in, in this course. But um, sweep is useful for delaying that drag divergence, right? That rise and drag due to wave drag. But it does have implications on other aspects as well in terms of your list distribution. So if I go back one slide, you'll notice that one of the examples here was a swept wing. And you'll see that it also stalls kind of out at the tips. And the reason why is you end up with basically a lot of span wise flow, a flow that kind of span goes starts going forward on the way out towards the tip and it loads up the lift on the wing tips of, of swept wings. Uh, so you do get a little bit of a distorted lift distribution with a little bit more uh, coefficient of lift out of the wings with swept wings as well. So that could be negative because ultimately if you saw any wing tips and you're going supersonic, that can affect stability, it can affect a lot of things as well. So it's something that's looked out for. But for the most part, sweep for you guys if you think about sweeping any of your designs, it's primarily going to be for stability and control, not necessarily for aerodynamics. So we'll talk about why you do that for stability and control later, later on. Aspect ratio, we've already talked about in terms of the impact. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of different aspect ratios to give you kind of a sense of what general size this value is. So generally when we talk about shorter stubby wings, fighter supersonic aircraft, around three is what you see for an aspect ratio. For gliders, you see 14, sometimes up to like 25 for aspect ratios for like those really purpose-built sailplanes uh, that are out there. You can see the U2 on the bottom with a 14 aspect ratio for that type of wing. And then for an airliner, round right about the teens. 10, lower teens is what you're gonna see. That's an Airbus 350, it's got a ratio around nine. But the other thing you see on that is the winglets, which was referred to above. So what do the winglets basically do? They build a little bit of a wall between that high pressure and low pressure. Right? They try to they prevent some of that swirl and that downwash from occurring at the wing tips uh, outward where the impact is greatest, right? Right at the tips. So you're not going to see an airline that is built today or in the future that probably doesn't have wings. Because what it does is it'll basically effectively increase your aspect ratio without having to make your wings wider or a bigger span, right? Because that has problems of its own, both structurally as well as just parking it next to a gate. You know, if you have these really, really long, meaty wings, it's hard to get close to a gate or move or around an airport. But mainly it's a structural issue, right? Once you get to these really long, cantilever wings, 
you're going to in, increase your weight for an airplane and the structural requirement for your airplane to the point where it's really not beneficial. So windlands are a way to effectively increase that aspect ratio without actually increasing. Now, the impact of that effect and the design of windlands is, is beyond this course. There's, there's whole research programs on changing windlands and designing windlands. Generally, it's different for every wing design out there. But there are some of these, there are conceptual approximations on how much those wings can affect your, your uh, drag, for example, that can be found out there if you need to look at it later on. Just to kind of hammer the point of the impact of aspect ratio, this is a really, really old plot. It's from Prandtl, so 1900s uh, ish time frame. He doesn't even use the normal uh, terms. This is your uh, coefficient of lift. This is your coefficient of drag. For some reason, he uses CL, CA, for those different things. And this is your aspect ratio that he's changing as he goes through. And this is increasing aspect ratio. As you can see, that bucket starts to widen as you increase the aspect ratio. So the amount of induced drag you experience at higher level attacks gets less and less pretty dramatically as you increase aspect ratio. To take it into a more modern kind of example, and kind of hammer it a little better, let's look at two different airplanes. So the top airplane is a British Tornado fighter aircraft, variable geometry, but even with its wings swung fully outward, it's a pretty low aspect ratio airplane. And the bottom uh, is what you consider a standard airline. And we're going to compare these two columns for the two. And this is our drag at cruise conditions at Mach 20 for both aircraft. And what I want you to see is that ultimately, because this is a low aspect ratio wing, 70% of the drag experienced by that airplane is due to induced drag. Just purely the result of having wing tips and having that down wash coming down over the top of the wing. Whereas if you look at this longer aspect ratio wing, only 25% of its induced of its total drag is a function of induced drag. Right, so pretty dramatic effect of increasing aspect ratio on, on a given wing. All right, and then finally we come full circle with our kind of final design discussion, talking about wing aircraft, so winging ground effect aircraft. So now we come back to what is ground effect, right? Is it is that cushion of air? And you can you see why people will describe that as a cushion of air, but really what you're doing is you're mitigating the impact of having wing tips. So purely by mitigating the impact of having wing tips, by mitigating that downwash. So if I'm up above the ground, I have this huge circulation occurring, causing a lot of downwash on my wing. The ground, acts to move that down component out to more of a lateral component on that as it swirls around. Right? So you get this more kind of gentle swirling of circulation around the wings. It's not that you're really developing a cushion or trapping air like a, like a hover cap. What you've done is basically just increase your lift purely by reducing some of the impacts of the induced drag and downwind. Right? So less drag, you suddenly get this change in your, your pressure distribution that gives you a little bit more lift than you normally would have if you weren't having that kind of floor preventing that circulation from occurring around the wing. So that impact can be really beneficial for lifting really, really heavy items like that huge plane without having to have a huge amount of wing if you don't carry it off the ground more than a few feet. And the impact of, of wing, you can see that effect, and this is typical for when you start looking at flying as well. Usually we think about like half a wingspan, but this kind of plots it out. So this bottom plot is your height above the ground versus your cord length. Of your, of your wing, and you can see you have to really be close to the ground relative to the size of your wing, about 0.1 there, in order to see that huge impact of lift. But it drops off pretty dramatically after that. So once you get out of that ground effect, you really, really lose that lifting ability rapidly, that added benefit uh, of that ground effect. So you have to stay really, really low in order for it to be beneficial. Is it still a design feature that's used today? Sure, there's a lot of companies that have been trying to market heavy lift aircraft to go across big lakes or across the ocean that are, can be built a little more efficiently just by not carrying that one above the ground, uh, a ground over the ground. Yeah. Would they drop it off that mass? What they kind of like keep you at that height? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah you, you would never, you wouldn't be able to rise above that. You wouldn't have a capacity to get above that ground effect if you wanted to. Uh, going forward. So yeah, you're really just stuck in a one kind of dimensional area where it's just good right there. All right. Any other questions? So that is pretty much the lecture today. There's one example here. I'm not going to do So I'm going to try to do a little bit better job of working some things out in, in, in class. I know the videos were well received by some. I will continue to try to do the videos to work out some to help those who, who don't always get to lecture or, or uh, 
you know, I have to speed through these and I do a lecture and I try to work things out. But this is just a very basic problem that just says, let's just figure out what a finite wing on a Cessna does to your lift gravity slope. So calculating your new uh, lift, or uh, your new lift curve slope based on using your two-dimensional and transitioning to three-dimensional and then calculating that total drag against the result. It's a pretty basic exercise. You'll be doing this in your lab as well. So it's a good start just to kind of look at it. You've got a couple of problems that also do this as well. But pretty straightforward uh, problem set based on kind of the, the formulations that we provided above. But take a look at it and, and see, uh, make sure you understand that concept. And again, we'll hammer it again when we get to the lab. So we'll start lab number one on Wednesday. All right, so those are your takeaways. Roughly about an hour uh, for this production. Again, thank you again for, for coming to this for a lecture uh, as opposed to getting a, a free lab off. If you have any questions, please let me know. Make sure you're checking in on Canvas. Do the quizzes by Friday midnight. Make sure you're looking at the homeworks uh, starting. And uh, we'll see you in lecture tomorrow morning.